Good morning and welcome. In the name of God, our Creator, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer. Whether you're joining us in the morning or in the afternoon or the evening or maybe even not on a Sunday, we welcome you and are so glad that you joined us for worship today. The first gospel writers, including the four in our scriptures, shared a lot of the same stories, but told them from very different points of view and trying to say different things about who Jesus is and why he mattered. And today, that has not changed. And here at PCW, we believe that everyone has a story to tell. Not only that, but a story of who Jesus is and why he matters today, right now, and in each of our lives. This only needs to be uncovered or discovered. That is what this new summer worship series is all about. Throughout the month, we will hear from each of your pastors about not only the union in Christ and unity in the church that they experience, as well as what distinctly stands out to them in their faith, what inspires them to give them hope and empowers them to live into the faith each of us has been baptized into. And it's our hope and our intention to help you to uncover your own perspective, your own voice, a running question for us this next month is, what is good news for you? What are the pieces of scripture that especially give you comfort? What challenges you to live with deeper integrity, grace, and love? We've had the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and today, we have the gospel according to Jeremy. And so friends, what's the gospel according to you? That's our task, and it starts today. Join us. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come and made us now We are your church And we need your power in us
Christ stands at the center of a mystery that I can scarcely understand or approach. Christ stands at the center of this place in which God's very life seeps into this world. And I recognize no greater authority in my life than the simple, life-altering love that is witnessed there. I recognize no greater authority in my entire life than that simple, life-altering, life-changing, life-transforming love that I witness by the presence of Christ in this world. And I want to start off right off the bat today with a story from Mark's gospel. Um, and, and the reason for it is it, it, the story that we're going to hear today, at least for me, the gospel according to Jeremy, is I find the very center of who Jesus is and why he matters in this story. It comes out of Mark's gospel. It's chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. It's a story of Jesus and the disciples crossing the, a small sea. And as that takes place, a storm comes up and Jesus quiets it, stills it. Okay. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? I think that last line bears repeating because I see it in different iterations all around me all the time. All right, so the, the, that story ends with the disciples witnessing what had just happened. And they, they are, we're told, filled with great awe. And they said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, these followers have walked with Jesus. They've watched him heal and teach and preach. They've eaten with him. They've goofed off together with Jesus. And yet they don't get it. Christ stands at the very center of a mystery that I scarcely can even approach. And it's because of that, that I recognize no greater authority in my life than the simple life-altering love that I witnessed there. You know, I've always been a little wary of people who um, are so certain that they, quote-unquote, know the will of God. If you feel like you've nailed it down, you know it, and you've got it, you've buried it, all you got to do is live your life a certain way because you know the will of God, it might be a sign that you're missing some of the mystery, some of the wonder of God's life in this world. It usually turns out that people that are that certain end up dressing up their own opinions with holy garb. And they're doing it for their own purposes. They're taking this religious meaning, this religious talk, and repurposing it for their own point of view. And I can still remember this kid from high school uh, back in Texas. His name was Chris, and back then we were actually pretty good buddies. You know, Chris was a great person. Uh, he, he and his sister were popular, and they were kind. They were generous. They genuinely cared about you if you were friends. The trouble came when someone they met, a person, did not fit Chris's idea of being worthy of God's love and peace. All right, but you can, I'm sure, imagine some of the types of people that might be not good enough outside of the norm. Oh boy. I and mean, we used to go rounds in argument over scripture. I mean, you gotta remember, this is back in high school, and we used to argue over this stuff. Man, I, I, I was the son of a seminary professor, and you know things like the Bible, theology, the way that we talk about God, this was common 
for dinner table discussions in my home. Chris grew up in the Church of Christ. Um, I do not mean the United Christ, uh, Church of Christ like we have up here in the Northeast. This is more of a fundamentalist group of Christians that's really common down in Texas. Um, I guess one way to translate it would be the Church of Christ that I grew up around in, in Texas makes the Southern Baptists look like pinko commies. They're fairly extreme. Chris knew his scripture quotes. He could fire off scripture with the gusto of like a military campaign. And the words of scripture that he used ended up becoming almost like weapons of war in his mouth. They were set to destroy anyone that he knew sat outside of God's care. Sometimes it was other religions. Sometimes it was um, issues around, you know, points of view on, on, on major political, you know, issues. Sometimes it had to do with sexuality or gender, et cetera. That was already starting back in the 90s. And Chris and I were friends, but we argued a whole lot, way too much. I probably gave him too little grace personally as I look back on it as a grown up. I gave him too little space to grow. But I was also convinced that he kept walking into the point of the gospel and still missing it. For him, the point of the gospel was a Jesus who came to show us the rigidness of what we had to do to live up to God's expectations and make it to heaven. Instead of coming face to face with Christ and recognizing the deep pool of love and peace that God is bringing into the world for us. You know, Chris's perspective, his point of view is common. It's all over the place. I mean, there are people in our church that are probably feeling a little uncomfortable right now because of the way that I'm talking about this, because it, it mirrors maybe perhaps more of where they come from. But the fact is, a lot of harm has been done throughout all of history just that way. People, all people, most of us, have this amazing gift of taking, of taking words that have been given to us in Scripture and other places um, intended for comfort, maybe even challenge, to challenge all of humanity. And we turn these words into these, I don't know, measures, these, these metrics of who does and does not belong. History is filled with God's will justifying marginalized groups, right? I mean, you have these people that either do or do not belong, and we fill up history books, right? Where we say, this is God's will, and then we use that to justify the way that we push aside people like women throughout history with people of color and white supremacy. Other religious, like the Jewish faith. I mean, these are our cousins in faith, and they are just as beloved in God's eyes by this good and loving God of ours. I mean, I have a hunch that the Jesus that this friend of mine, Chris, this Jesus that he saw may have been more of a reflection of the sort of power Chris wanted to come and sort out the world, as Chris would have had it done. This Jesus, the Jesus that he envisioned, was the perfection of all of Chris's best ideas about right and wrong. This Jesus, the one he imagined, was the logical end of this moral universe of Chris's own making. And yet, imbued with the kind of power to force it to happen in this world. The problem is, that's not the Jesus I know. That's not the Jesus I witness in Scripture. Christ stands at the very center of a mystery that I can scarcely approach or understand. And yet I trust that Jesus, the one that I can barely understand, I trust that more than the common wisdom of this world. I mean, it's right there in the story that we heard today. It's repeated throughout Scripture in different tones. It's carried in different melodies throughout Scripture. But somehow in this Christ, somehow in this itinerant preacher from the Levant region, right, 2,000 years ago, 
Somehow in that person, humanity witnessed the character, the very soul of God. And people back then, they didn't know what to do with him. And yet they were drawn to him. The same is true today. In fact, I mean, right now, even as we watch church participation plummeting all over the country, people who have no faith background will talk about Jesus and his teachings, and they'll say, yeah, Jesus had great ideas. I just wish his followers would listen to him. This is a common refrain. And this is some, there's something in this life of Christ, right? This life of Jesus that calls to us to be a truer version of ourselves, perhaps even a better version of ourselves. There is something in this life of Jesus that reminds us of a truth that ends up being obscured by everyday life. There is a truth in this world that gets covered up that Jesus reminds us of. So let's talk about this story today, because the, the story is absolutely amazing. Right? We have the, the day is ending, and the disciples toss a weary Jesus into the boat. They head across this teeny tiny little sea. We're even told that there are other boats with him, right? And so this whole group sets off to cross to the other side, and a sudden storm arises. And really, this is actually not that uncommon for that region because you'll end up having bursts of warm and cool air intermixing and it creates really strong wind storms very quickly. So the churning of that air can be really dangerous for small boats, for groups trying to travel. And in this case, the storm catches everybody off guard. It starts sinking the, 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 their little boat, this little craft. And here's Jesus, he's asleep. They cry out for help. They're terrified. They're confused. And they're really completely bewildered how it is that their teacher seems completely without worry at all as they're all perishing. And Jesus rises. Jesus tells off the storm. Jesus speaks peace itself into nature. And then he turns to the disciples and asks, why are you so afraid? Do you still not have any faith? And two things come at us right off the bat from this exchange. Number one, as said before, somehow in this Christ, somehow in this person, Jesus, we witness the very character, the soul of God. And when we do that, we discover a God who is with us and for us, for humanity, for you and me. And number two, Christ rises, stands up, as the disciples are whimpering in fear. And Jesus calls peace into nature itself. I mean, I'm immediately reminded of the phrase from John's gospel where Jesus, he's preparing to say goodbye. Okay, so this is chapter 14. And it's the same speech where Jesus is talking about there being many dwelling places, many palaces in God's household. And towards the end of that chapter, Jesus also says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you the way the world gives. So here we have it. God is with us and for us. Somehow that comes true in Jesus. God also has power that we completely do not understand. And the same power that quiets the storm is the exact same power of peace that Jesus is offering to us. It's this peace that surpasses understanding, a peace that moves us beyond problems instead of simply removing them. I mean, the way that our world typically, at least the common wisdom of our world, but the way that our world works is that if a problem comes along, you must with it, you must remove it, you must make it an X problem. If we make a mistake, we must erase the mistake. If we have a pest in the garden, we eliminate the pest. If there is a group of undesirable people, well, we know history. If we come to an impasse, there must be a winner and there must be a loser. If there is to be success, there must be a winner or a loser. 
If there is to be wealth, security, popularity, safe housing, power, all the things this world cares about, if that is to be, there must be a winner and a loser. If there is to be peace, then our war machine must terrify the world into submission. The fact is, we worship self-made security. I mean, recently I heard a politician um, speaking in a church, and this person said that if Jesus had only had an assault rifle, he would not have been crucified. I mean, just like my old friend Chris, this person walks into the point and still misses it. Over and over and over again, people throughout the stories of, of Jesus, including his own temptation by the devil at the beginning of, of his ministry, over and over again, people try to put the power of this world into Jesus's hands. They want to give it to him. And even at one point, he's told that he could actually save himself from arrest and trial and death just by taking control. But at every single moment, at every single temptation, at every point, Jesus turned from political power to name that his power, to name that his purpose in this world is different. And so here we are in this, in this story from today. An exhausted Jesus is asleep in the stern, the back of a tiny little boat crossing a sea that is scarcely larger than a lake. He's awoken by his terrified friends, and does he destroy nature to save his friends? Does he whisk them away to safety? No. Jesus speaks peace into nature itself. Christ calls with the power not of this world, and frankly, we can't understand it. And so we call it a miracle. Jesus shows up not to control the levers of earthly power. No, Jesus shows up with the power to transform. Christ stands at the center of a mystery that I scarcely can approach. And I recognize no greater authority in my life than the simple life altering love that I witnessed there.
Friends, as we have heard about what it means to understand our story and what we especially connect to in the Gospels and in the overarching story of Scripture, we also know that we have a common story. We have a story that is right here at the table where everyone is welcome, where everyone who thinks differently is connecting to something that is distinct from you or who looks, acts, believes, loves differently than you, they're welcome here at this table from this common loaf and this common cup. And so at this time, if you have not uh, gathered your own communion elements, uh, take a moment to pause and uh, go ahead and get to those crackers, that bread, that especially good sort source of communion for you, as well as wine, grape juice, something that would remind you of God's love for you. And so then when we come back, we can remember that, friends, this is not my table. This is not the Presbyterian Church in Westfield's table. This isn't even the Presbyterian church's table. This is God's table. And because so, absolutely everyone is welcome to it. We hear now from our liturgy, the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right to give our thanks and praise. Pray with me. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, God of majesty and splendor. By your power, you created all that is, making a universe out of chaos and ruling over all things in love. Throughout the ages, you called your people to love and serve you and to be your light among the nations. When we failed you, you did not fail us and sent prophets to call us back to your ways. We praise you in the fullness of time. You revealed your love by sending your son, Jesus, to be the light of the world. He came to heal our brokenness and to set before us the ways of injustice and peace. Therefore, we praise you and join our voices together in any way that we can fathom who can sing your glorious name. And Lord, we come to you also lifting up our prayers for those who we love, our friends, our family, our neighbors, our church community and family. But Lord, we also take time to lift up silently and aloud those we remember at this time. Lord, you know what is on our heart and in our mind, all of the people known and unknown to us who are suffering, hurting, grieving, struggling, in pain, but we also remember those who are rejoicing, full of life, and who are good people. Lord, by your spirit, grant what we ask. Illumine our hearts, O oh God, with the radiance of Christ's presence, that our lives may show forth his love in this weary world. Send us to befriend the lost, to serve the poor, to reconcile our enemies, and to love our neighbors. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this common bread and the fruit of the vine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. But until then, we remember on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was gathered with his friends, with his beloved, and he took bread and he broke it, saying, take, 
eat. This is my body. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, Christ took the cup, blessed it, saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new testament, new promise in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, by the unity and power of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And we seal these, our prayers, with you, the one who your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The bread which we break is the body of Christ for us. The cup of blessing we bless is the blessing and blood of Jesus Christ. These are the gifts of God for each of you, for each of us, the people of God. And so come, for all things are now ready. The body of Christ broken for you. The cup of salvation poured out for you. Amen. You know, this coming up week, uh, your homework, your challenge is to pause just every once in a while, just to pause through all the hustle and bustle of life. And to do this, I want you to consider how you would put this whole mess of faith into your words. What is good news for you? What are the pieces in scripture that especially give you comfort? What challenges you, okay? What challenges you to live with deeper integrity, with deeper grace, and with deeper love? And so as you do this, I, I want you to carry that challenge into the week, okay? But as you do this, know that you are loved far more than you could ever hope or imagine. And friends, please be at peace. Be at peace that Christ gives, not that this world gives.